Welcome everyone. This is so you've just raised two million dollars. How to go from how to use data-driven PR to go from seed to Series A. My name is uh, Ben Kaplan. I'm the CEO of PR Hacker. And please repeat after me. I will, I will. Grow, my grow my brand. I will, I will. Grow, it fast. grow it fast. I will, I will. Take, my company. take my company straight to the top. I will, I will laugh at all of Ben's jokes, <laughs> all of Ben's jokes. even if even they, are not funny. they are not funny. So Ben, so Ben, so Ben, so ben. show me the traction. Show me the Say it one more time on the count of three for your investors. One, two, three. Show me the traction. Okay, very good. Give yourselves a round of applause. We're in the right place. Let's show you, let's show you the traction. So, um, at PR Hacker, we're kind of an unusual PR agency because we're a PR agency that believes in data. We believe in AV testing, multivariate testing, mathematics, measurement, and optimization. Um, whenever I come to one of these presentations, I, I think of two things, which is one, be careful of who you take advice from. And two, be patient with those who give you advice. So here's a little bit to understand our perspective, how we look at the world, and, and some of the kind of tips and advice we'll give today. So we're PR hacker. Um, people sometimes call us a couple things. Uh, one, a firm that plays money ball. We like to like kind of use data and metrics to give ourselves the edge. Um, the buzzpeed of PR firms, we like to write sometimes, you know, 25 versions of a headline of a pitch and A-B test them against each other and see what really works. Um, and the kind of perspective in the world we live in is this world of mass media PR, influencer outreach, social media, real-time video, and content marketing. So we're going to kind of touch upon all those things. I think the key point here for anyone, and how, so how many people are actually in a, in a startup company now? How many people have raised a seed round, hence the title? Okay. How many people are going, trying to get to a Series A? How many people are somewhere else in their life cycle? Okay. <laughs> How, how, how many others are just like a big brand, someone else, someone that just wants to hack the system a little bit more? Okay, so good. So we're in the right place. So what we're going to do today is look for ways to have disproportionate leverage. That's what we always want. Disproportionate leverage means the effort you put in does not equal what you get out. You get way more than what comes out, and it turns out there's some little things you can do to make that possible. So um, we're going to use a lot of these kind of five tactics. Um, based in San Francisco, we're here. We've become the fastest growing P PR firm in the world. And of course, I have to have this slide. We're hiring. So if you're looking for a job, let us know. Okay? So to give you a sense of how it all began and sort of how I became a PR hacker, why we started the company, it kind of goes back to a, a photo that looks like this. This is me at age like 17 or 18. And yeah, I'm the same. I'm the same. Just that goofy. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get any sleeker or smoother. And so um, I was a kid who won. Uh, $90,000 in college scholarships. That was my little claim to fame. I was going to go to school on tennis scholarship. I got an injury, got a stress fracture, needed a, way, a different way to pay for school. And I started hustling around, winning all these scholarships. And um, that became my like, little calling card. And I thought, hey, what if I wrote a book about this? So I wrote a book about this. I printed 5,000 copies, um, self-published, delivered to my parents' garage. And all of a sudden, it was like, oh, crap. My parents have to park outside. <laughs> What do I do? How do I move these books? And so I started thinking, OK, how can I get, like, you know, I'm just one person. My, pa my parents were kind of helping me at the time. This is, I'm, I'm 38 now, so this was like 1999. And it's like, OK, how can I move these books? And so what I started doing is, like, how can we create stories that will get covered? Because I can't afford any advertising. I can't pay for anything. How do I create a story to get noticed? And so one of the first things I figured out how to do was, OK, Let's go across the country and create a story about the kid who paid for school by winning scholarships is now has a bus and he's going across the country to do it too. So this is kind of the first foray into like a little bit of like viral PR, how to get noticed. I was able to convince the CEO of Sally May to loan me his 40-foot tour bus, his personal tour bus. So that was good. And they sponsored the tour. And I went across the country doing this. And when you do that, that helps you get noticed um, because you get on Oprah. When you get on Oprah, if anyone has, has, has like ever written a book or, or wants to write a book, you sell a lot of books. 
it's a simple math. Like get on Oprah equals a lot of book sales. So um, ended up um, selling, uh, even before Oprah, 65,000 copies in the first year. Oprah helped us sell hundreds of thousands more, even though we didn't have bookstore distribution. And then it became the best-selling um, scholarship book in the world with 1.5 million readers worldwide. And I think the, the discipline of that in, in the process and, and why this is you know, relevant for all of you that have startup companies is that the discipline of having to move a physical product, like you can't even just get someone to like click on a button, you know, ooh, the button lights up, I click on it, oh, converted, they're a user, you know, it's like, you gotta get them to like walk in a bookstore, the book's not in the bookstore, you gotta get them to ask for the book, they gotta order the book, then they gotta come back, pick it up, buy it, and if enough people do that, you build up distribution. So the only point I wanna make is that it instills a kind of discipline because everything we're gonna talk about today is how you cause whether that's B2C or B2B, your users, your customers to take action right away and how you create the conditions that cause action. And when you can do that, you can really, really grow your company fast. Okay. Um, so um, here's, this is what the kind of book looks like now. Um, if anyone ha is going to college or has kids uh, going to college soon, I hope the fact that I'm on the cover does not deter you from actually reading the book. It's, it's, a, it's a good, hopefully a good book. Okay, so, and, and just finally to bring the, the story full circle, um, uh, I'm going to just draw upon myself. I've been like, you know, a, a guest expert on a lot of shows, CNN, Fox News. I was a syndicated columnist, a spokesperson. And now um, for our agency, we have a lot of startup companies as clients, but a lot of big brands like Milkbone, Smuckers, Del Monte City. Um, we're doing some new stuff for Budweiser, Bud Light. Um, so we're going to take lessons from all of that as we go through. Okay. And the final thing I'll say before we actually start the tips is that um, I think there's sheets going around for lightning pitches and what we're going to do at the end, it's usually people's favorite thing, is we'll have anyone who wants to participate come up, give your pitch in 30 seconds and we will in five minutes brainstorm live kind of PR, mass media, social media, viral marketing all in one for you all at the end. So <laughs> fill out that form, pass it up and then we'll do that at the end. Okay? So five ways to grow fast from seed to series A or whatever your milestone Maybe we're going to focus on a few different things. And, and has anyone is at a company that just raised recently, that just just fundraised? Okay, okay, a couple a couple people. So what this is kind of like the playbook a little bit for you just raised or you're trying to get to that next milestone. What are five things you need to do right away to like put in place a a program, a PR program, a viral marketing program, a digital uh, campaign program that makes a difference right away? Okay, so. Way number one is define how you're perceived. Define how you're perceived. And there's a lot of ways to do this and surprising ways that you can shape the perception of your brand in profound ways that can accelerate your growth much, much faster based on how people perceive you. So question is, why is this news? Who here recognizes this picture? Okay. Few people were at my prior presentation, so you like you recognize it a little bit. Okay, um, this is for those of you who don't realize this is a couple making out. <laughs> and this is a, you guys have been working long hours, like haven't done that in a long time. Thank you for reminding me. No, this is a couple making out, um, and this was one of the most three most published photos in the world in 2011. Okay, so the question is why? So if you zoom out, this is why. This is a couple making out during the 2011 Vancouver riots, which is not a great reason for a riot. It was like the hockey team lost and people rioted, so not a fantastic reason. But nonetheless, what makes this interesting, this couple, is that it's the context of, well, they're on the street in the middle of a riot making out. Why, wait, what's the story there? What are they doing? Why are they doing that? There's a lot of questions. So suddenly, this is news. So the point I'm trying to make is, this is your product. You guys, whatever your product is, is a couple making out. With that, what I mean by that is not that you don't have a super interesting product, you probably do. Not that you don't have a, project, a product that's, you know, to use the, the, the jargon around here, disruptive. You probably do. But in the context of world events, in the context of terrorist attacks, in the context of the presidential election, in the context of all this, there's just like a lot of noise out there, right? So in the scheme of things, overall, how you're perceived, um, you need to, one, make um, uh, make yourself known if you're a startup and you're growing. And two, you have to create this. You have to create the perception around you that makes you suddenly important. This strategic context. And that doesn't mean, if you're a, you know, if you're a B2C company, 
That can mean that, okay, this is in with consumers and the public. If you're a B2B, that means perception in your industry, in your vertical, with the 100 enterprise companies that can purchase your software. Whatever it is, you have to build that strategic context. And I want to give you a B2C example of how you can do this and a B2B example of how you can do this as well. Okay, so creating a strategic, create a strategic context for your brand that defines a new market position. And this is the other part of this we're going to talk about, which is once you have that milestone where you've just raised, you're trying to grow, you're accelerating, the market position you've had does not need to equal the market position in the future. And that strategic context can help with that. Okay, so here's a B2C example, and then we'll do B2B. So B2C example is um, Kloof. Think of it as Instagram for pet lovers. And, and what is unique about Kloof is that in terms of their perception, if they're perceived as another pet app, it's going to be difficult, right? They're kind of starting from scratch, starting from zero users. It's, it's, com it's kind of a competitive space. And, and it's even unclear because, hey, people have Instagram. They can share you know, photos of pets there. Why do they need Instagram for pet lovers, right? So how can we position their perception to highlight the fact that really what they're about is not so much about the pets. They're actually about the connections you make with other people as a pet parent by having that kind of shared interest. That's really what they're about. So how can we heighten that perception to say, hey, this is actually kind of a social network based around your love of pets more than just a, an app where you, show, you share you know, cute photos of, of what Fido's doing, okay? So let's, let's create that perception. So what we want to do to do that is create a strategic context in the messaging that highlighted those relationships and a feature of the app, in fact, where you could see people walking their dog around you and um, potentially you could like go on a doggy walking date or something like that. So we're highlighting the relationships. We had the strategic context for dating and romance. We're going to change the perception. And we conducted a survey of 2,000 people to determine what your dog's <coughs> breed says about you. Or more simply put, a little more frankly put, like if you're at the dog park and you have a dog, which dog gets you the hot date? Okay? And I see a few of you were like not taking notes. You're like, oh, this is good stuff. Okay, I'm running this down. So. Um, the answer is actually, if, if you're a woman and you want to attract a guy, the best dog breed you can have is a golden retriever. You're seeing, as, is there any, any women here have a golden retriever? Okay, go get one this weekend. Um, a golden retriever you're seeing as sweet and loving and caring, but if you have a chihuahua, do any women here have a chihuahua? If you have a chihuahua, then you're, oh yeah, okay, you're, you're not careful. This is, okay, this is, a, this is a stereotype, it's just a survey, but if you have a chihuahua, you're possibly hot but dumb and possibly high maintenance. No, 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 okay, it's a stereotype, right? Okay, so guys, uh, the best dog breed you could have um, is a Siberian Husky. Anyone here have a Siberian Husky? Brad, no? You need to get one? Okay, no? Okay, if you have a Siberian Husky, then you're strong, protective, and responsible. You're a father figure. But if you have a pit bull, then you're, I'm sorry, you're sketchy, slimy, and untrustworthy. Okay, so these are stereotypes. It's a fun survey. But how does this now position the brand to highlight, oh, wow, this is about relationships. One type of relationship is a romantic relationship. And how can we then amplify their message? So this is um, the Today Show. Um, four minutes, about seven million viewers. Them discussing top dog, Kloof survey, dogs most likely to land you a date. Uh, this is um, the other top two morning shows in the US. Good Morning America, what, what your do Boiling Hot, what dogs say about you. CBS This Morning, what your dog says about your sex life. Um, by the way, that was one of the headlines we A-B tested and multivariate tested. So we went with that for some um, things. You'll see this here. Time Magazine, what your dog says about your sex life. Huffington Post, and in the UK and Canada, in 21 countries around the world. Um, they went from zero to 20,000 users in, in a day. So your perception that you create, you have the ability to define that. Suddenly, this is an app, this is potentially a social network, this is potentially you know, a dating connection. This is more than a pet app based on how we create the story. And so when you have that milestone, when you're growing, you have a chance to define how you're perceived, and you can do that in profound ways. One other example, I'll just share before we do our B2B example, one other consumer example, is we had a client, and they make an app that, can detect, that has many features. It's like sort of a Swiss army knife of features for your Android phone. And it can do lots of things. Like it can, it's like sort of intelligent and in knowing, uh, OK, if you're sleeping, it automatically turns off your phone for you while you're sleeping so you won't be disturbed. It kind of does automatic things you normally have to set up. And so one of the things we did in their perception, and as we did their messaging, was they had a feature in there where they could detect that you're driving and read your text messages to you without you having to do anything. So all of a sudden, we saw that feature. We said, hey, 
if we're trying to highlight the utility, we want to create an emotional connection with the audience, what if we do a story focused on that that's about how to convince your kids never to text and drive again? That story had so much resonance in hundreds of media outlets around the country. I think 25 plus sheriff's departments actually started petitions to get kids to sign a petition not to text and drive. That in the next iteration of the app, the app became entirely focused around that feature. So the point is, when you have strong messaging, when you shape how you're perceived, that feedback can even shape your entire product roadmap as that develops a certain resonance. Okay? So let's give you a B2B example, just so it's not just all B2C. And I like, this is an old school example. And I, and I like this client because he, he's, he's an old school guy. This is Howard Ecker and Company, which is a re commercial real estate company. Um, and he did the original lease on the Transamerica building. Okay, so he's like a legend of real estate, super old school. You can see how he's dressed there overlooking the city. I like him a lot. If you go to his office, it's unbelievable. It's like so old school. It's, so, it's awesome. And so um, he then you know, has a lot of clients who are law firms, ad agencies, accounting agencies. And how do we shift the perception of him? He's an old school guy to say, hey, all of these startups in the room, as you start growing and scaling and you get to you know, 500 employees, you need to call Howard Ecker to get you your new office. How do we do that? So we're changing the perception. And so we were creating stories that shift how we think of him. One of, the, one of the things we did was we pitched and did a series of articles for Fast Company specifically on issues with startups who are scaling. And we got him sort of a column on Fast Company where he would talk about these kind of issues to shift the perception right away. We went to his main market, which is Chicago. And we started placing all kinds of startup data and news in, in the publication. So here is the headline, Startup Culture Inspires Changes in Traditional Chicago Office Spaces. So suddenly, he's at the forefront of how startups are changing. We went to other places that are more kind of like hip and trendy, kind of like younger sort of business outlets. So we went to Chicago Grid. There, uh, you can tell this is hip and trendy because their slogan is all up in your business. <laughs> it's, a business it's a business blog. And we started placing interviews with him. So now, the perception of this old school legend of real estate is actually he's all about startups, growth, what's the new open office configuration, and his, his perception has changed. And you can change that perception in as little as like three months if you're diligent about how you do this. So the biggest point to know is like how you're perceived is not set in stone. In fact, you create that perception. Brings us to the second thing that's on your playbook that you need to do, which is slingshot past your competitors. Is anyone here um, kind of an astronomy astronomy fan or you look at stars or comets or a few people? You'd be, like, be proud of that. Be like, yeah, astronomy. There you go. Okay, good. So this is how you slingshot around a planet. Okay? So what you do is you take your spacecraft, which has velocity here. Here's a planet. The planet is moving at a certain rate. You go around the planet. And when you come out after the planet, you can actually be up to two times the speed of the planet plus your speed when you entered. Um, this is called the slingshot shot effect. Uh, anyone seen the movie Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks? Okay, this is how he got home. Okay, the slingshot effect. So, how as a new growing company with lots of larger competitors and players, how can you use this to your advantage? So this is how to slingshot past a larger company. This is you. This is your company, this is your brand, this is your product, and this is your larger competitor who's much more well-known, and they already have PR coverage, but you're new. So what we want to do is leverage everything they're doing here, slingshot around it to propel us forward and make us larger, more important, bigger, and better at a faster rate. So this is a surprising thing. If your competitors have been getting great coverage, great exposure, that's good news for you. And, and, and here's, here's the playbook way. So to create a PR slingshot, we can leverage the earned media coverage of your competitors. And here's the, here's the playbook. Number one, and this is uh, the first three are in the first 30 days. Search for all competitor earned media coverage in the past 12 months. So at PR Hacker, we onboard, onboard a new client. We're like, okay, you have larger competitors. We're going to search. And we have tools that we've kind of built and, and, and kind of hacked together to do this that helps us look and say, okay, all your competitors, what coverage have they gotten in the past 12 months? Second thing, we take all that coverage, and we have some tools to help us do this, that maps that to a comprehensive list of media contacts. 
right? So now you've looked at all their coverage. You got competitor A, B, and C. They have certain media contacts. We've written those stories. And now we have a list of those contacts, step two. Step three, we pitch the media list with a story that highlights our competitive edge. So we, even within that first 30 days, we're going out to all of those media contacts that has ever written a story about our competitor. And we're not just going out with a story that says, hey, you wrote a story about our competitor, this is us. No, we're highlighting competitive advantage and a story in a way that has value to the end audience, something we call a story-based approach. So it's not about um, what we're trying to communicate, it's how do we add value to the end audience. Okay? So those first three things, all of a sudden right there, what we're doing is every outlet that ever covered our competitor, that has demonstrated an interest in our topic, we're leveraging all that work our competitor had to do, right? They probably, maybe they did it themselves, maybe they had a PR firm, they had to do a lot of pitching, they had to figure out where are all the places where stories can run? Who's going to run this? And we can do that for ourselves, we will, but why not leverage all of that work for our advantage? And in fact, number four, track competitor earned media coverage on an ongoing basis, okay? Track competitor earned media coverage on an ongoing basis. So as there are more hits that they get, we could actually leverage that into more coverage for us and target those covering competitors those covering competitors with new stories that overshadow them. Okay, so let me give you an example that will make all of this make sense. So I, I kind of this is um, for a client we, we just started with this week. So we're implementing all of this now, and I kind of hid their name just so you know to, to, to not kind of put you know put the world on notice about their media coverage. But up until this point, they're a smaller company, a smaller brand that, that faces off against a really big brand that has about 66 percent global market share. But they're a small um, startup that potentially can grow fast and they have potentially a better product than the market leader. So this is what we did. We ran these numbers and this is on, on, on the left side right there is global news. So that is the market leaders is generating about 5,000 in three months, 5,000 um, sort of media coverage items. Something that they were mentioned in the media. Now that startup is a tiny, tiny fraction of that right now. Now if we look here at social media, Social media, that market leader is generating about 26,000 social media posts of some sort in a three month period. Our mar market leader, I think they were at four or 500 or something like that, right? So that's a big discrepancy, but can we do that? Can we leverage that to suddenly accelerate like the slingshot effect our, our startup, okay? So I wanna show you an example in which we did that. So this is a case study, which is this Amber Knight. And we did a lot of testing on the messaging um, in preparation for their first launch. And this is, um, we came up with the world's first drinkable super meal. Okay, what they do is um, basically they are able to create a, a powder, but it's from all whole foods. So they actually like, ground a powder of whole foods, real foods, into um, what would be the, the kind of recommended daily nutrients that you need from food if you drank their shake. Okay, so we have a new product. At the time, they don't have um, really any use any customers they're launching um, one challenge is it's a premium product it's like really good food that they're pulverizing but it has kind of a higher price tag as a result so how do we then not start from scratch and have to educate and build people how do we slingshot around a larger competitor and so here's the larger competitor which was Soylent okay so Soylent was much more well known and so what we did here and you can see you can't really see it here but I highlighted it we started out by building that list of every place Soylent has gotten coverage, targeting, turning those into contacts with journalists, and reaching out with our competitive edge, our competitive advantage, which was a higher quality product, right? And we had lots of stories, so we had stories for all these outlets on, okay, if you're traveling, how to have, how to stay healthy even when you're on the go. And okay, you're an executive and at a company and you have 10 minutes for lunch, how to have a lunch that gives you energy for the afternoon, just doesn't make you tired. But we, so we created these new stories, these new story ideas, but we, we took the shortcut. We leveraged all the people that had covered Soylent before. So this is Time Magazine running the headline, you can see. Soylent has some competition and we taste tested it, right? We're leveraging that coverage, the larger player. This is Wired Magazine. Premium Soylent rival fuels the food drink revolution. Okay, we're piggybacking on them to get coverage we probably otherwise couldn't get. Fast Company, Soylent meets Whole Foods. Am Ambro and Knight is an organic high-end meal replacement shake. U.S. News and World Report, 
Meals of the future. Will Soylent and Ambronite make food obsolete? Not too bad for us because we're being put side by side with them and they're a much bigger player, much more well known at this point. Ars Technica. If Soylent makes you nervous, you might like Ambronite, but it's not cheap. Okay? So, um, all of that there is leveraging those bigger players to slingshot. So, I think, you know, we have this tendency to, to at startups to be, okay, we're coming into this new market. Wow, there's these big players. We have to grow fast. Our investors are saying we need growth yesterday. How are we going to ever compete with these bigger players? Because, you know, they have millions of dollars to spend on this. We don't. Instead, if you shift your perception and think, oh, wow, they've paved this road for me. I can slingshot on what they've already d have done and in fact supersede them, then you're going to accelerate and supercharge your growth. Okay, so upon launching the product, Ambronite sold $100,000 in product in the first 30 days with no in-store distribution, simply by doing this and simply by leveraging um, the slingshot process. Brings us to way number three. Generate data to create the news. Generate data to create the news. So, we do a lot with data-driven PR at PR Hacker, and um, that process means a lot of different things. It means optimizing the stories we're pitching, A-B testing them, using multivariate testing against headlines. It means optimizing our pitch time. Um, that means that, okay, we track the best time to pitch all of these media contacts throughout the US. What's, you know, should we pitch 3.32 p.m. on a Wednesday? Is that the optimal time? We do that too. But how do we then take it one step further and create an ongoing program where it's not like we have to come out with a new product feature to generate news. It's not like we have to make a splashy new hire. Oh, we just hired the CMO of blah, 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 and we want to announce it to make news. It's not even that we have to say, oh, we just hit our millionth user to generate news. Those are all good news items. But how do we create a data program to create the news? And in fact, what I would suggest is that when you are actually building your product, um, your solution, your service, you build in the data piece in mind, not only for your own insight, so you can measure and test and you have great data for your investors, but actually with a marketing purpose in mind. And when you say, okay, I'm creating data because I want to help with the marketing. I want to be able to create news. I want to generate uh, earned media coverage that accelerates my growth. Suddenly you approach it a little differently. So think like a journalist to create data that aligns with the cultural or industry calendar. So how we create news and how we make it relevant is it's relevant right now. So if all of you have apps or products or services that deal with summer road trips, that's, and you have data, that's relevant right now because a lot of people are on summer road trips, right? But pretty soon we're coming into back to school. Back to school is coming up. If you have any application that doesn't have to be direct for black back to school, it might just be, uh, for instance, we have clients now that uh, deal with setting habits as a family. So if we're doing that, we could, back to school is a time where as a family, you set new habits because your kids are going back to school maybe from yourself. It might not even be an app or a product that has to do with back to school, right? So we're thinking about the cultural industry calendar. If you're a B2B company, maybe there's a sales cycle. I don't know, do sales pick up in August, September? Sometimes maybe all of those enterprise purchasers are coming back from summer break and now they're talking about, or maybe that's when their budget cycle is. Is there stories and data that we can use that align with that? So we're thinking with a calendar in mind. So here's a couple examples. Um, for Marchex, this is a B2B example, which is an ad tech company. What they do, a, a client, they um, actually have call analytics for how you go from, if you're like um, searching online and you use that Google click to call button and it goes to a call center, they have a solution that helps you track that better so that call center knows how to answer that call, knows what you've seen already, more like an online sales process even though it's offline. So we help them build the Marchex Institute. And that Marchex Institute specifically leveraged the data they had from their calls to create stories that could generate them covers. So here's a story here in the New York Daily News. The swearing heart of it all, study finds Ohioans curse more than anyone else in the nation. So one of the things that you could use their technology for was they could actually track calls and search for keywords and know if someone's like, you know, swearing during the call and actually could aggregate that by state. So we helped them do that, create a story. So now what are the most polite and motor, what are the most rude states in the US? Suddenly we can create that and we create a whole series of stories from the Marchex Institute. We like that so much that we created the RepairPal Institute. <laughs> So the RepairPal Institute, RepairPal, another client, um, 
It's the best place if you have to get an auto repair and you want to see what are a certified repair, repair shop in your area and you want to know that you're getting a fair price, you go to RepairPal. So we cr uh, created the RepairPal Institute and for them we released the, car, the RepairPal Institute Car Repair Index. So actually for this one, we rank states across the US on how expensive it is to repair your car in that state. So we created a basket of repairs that are common. We use their data to price it out in, uh, in states across the US. And now we're getting coverage like here in the Salt Lake Tribune, Utah ranks 11th for most affordable car repairs by leveraging that. So the point is that you can create data that makes you more newsworthy and data is actually a valuable commodity. Why? Because a journalist would love to create it for himself or herself, but it's hard. It takes time. So this is how we can add value to the process. Here's a more dramatic example. How do you make a boring product a sexy topic that all media will cover? Who here has a boring product? Raise your hand. Okay, you're like, you're like it's super boring. Okay, wait, wait, what is your product? It's an IoT device that measures the density of the snow and calls firefighters before a building collapses. Okay, well, it sounds important. It's, 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 she said it's, it measures the density of the snow to call firefighters before a building collapses. Wow, that's, that, that, sounds, that sounds important. That sounds, that sounds good. I can see great stories for that when it's snow season in certain areas and talking about the risks in that area that you can create. So, okay, I actually don't think it's that, that boring. I'm gonna, I have a more boring topic for you. My, my boring topic is green beans. Specifically, <laughs> canned, specifically canned green beans, okay? So we are going to make canned green beans sexy, okay? I promise you we'll make it sexy. So canned green beans, hard to generate a story. Ben, you're telling me create data to be in the news all the time. I, you know, I don't know, uh, you know what kind of data is there about can canned green beans. So, so here's what we did. We did a survey of 2,000 people to determine which U.S. states love green bean casserole the most. I can tell you that this story will not get covered 50 weeks out of the year by anyone. In fact, they'd probably laugh if we pitched it. But what do you think are the two weeks out of the year where suddenly this is highly relevant and a highly sexy topic? Anyone? Thanksgiving. 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 The holiday, the one holiday where you eat green bean casserole, right? So we're, so this is what, my point here is that maybe you have a product or software or an app that naturally creates data, right? So you can do that. I see Austin here, Austin is with Lyft. I know, okay, Lyft has probably a lot of interesting data on the patterns of people driving around. There's a limited number of things they could do. But not everyone here is like that. So what about if you're not Lyft, how do you create data that makes you relevant? And so here's an example with something like a simple survey. So here's what happened. The winning headline, Thanksgiving story, Kentucky ranked number one for love of green bean casserole. Is anyone here from Kentucky? Do you like green bean casserole? Love it. You love it, okay. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So, the ranks number one. Now, here, here's the coverage. So, we pitched a unique ranking for in all 50 states. So, every state, media that got like, oh, you know, California ranked number 27. Like, Alaska, step up your game. You're ranked 49. Come on, let's do this, right? So, everyone got a different ranking. So, this is TV station, Denver, Colorado, and we created B roll, which is basically, you know, video that showcased Del Monte products so that we got basically free TV advertising across the country of them using our B-roll. So this is Colorado ranks eighth for green bean casserole lovers. Houston, Texas, Texas number 14 for a love of green bean casserole. Lexington, Kentucky, Del Monte survey, Kentucky ranked number one, 78% really like or love the dish. And by the way, we're planting in people's minds that everyone loves green bean casserole because the subliminal message here is that, whoa, your in-laws are coming over and you're, you're like not making green bean casserole, oh. I don't know if I want to be you on Thanksgiving night. Right, we're, we're playing that everyone loves. So there's, 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 that's kind of like defining the perception around our product. We're actually, by the process of ranking, actually subliminally saying everyone likes green bean casserole. What's the truth? Like mashed potatoes ranks super, <laughs> a lot higher, honestly. But green bean casseroles, it's right, it's, it's, it's there. We want to make the case, okay? So this is CBS radio rank each state's local ranking across their entire national network of radio. So this is CBS Chicago. Illinois barely makes top 20 states that love green bean casserole a prestigious list, we assure you. <laughs> um, it ran as the lead story on the front page of Yahoo and was shared um, 
countless times, I, I think millions of times on Facebook. According to Del Monte, 30 million green bean casseroles will appear on tables across the country this Thanksgiving. And you can see Kentucky named the capital of that legendary Thanksgiving dish. And we also laser targeted our pitch with media outlets of heavy, that have audiences of heavy canned food users. Does anyone here read Living the Country Life magazine? Virginie, yes, no? Okay, so Living the Country Life magazine, the readers of that are heavy canned food users. So the point is that as we create this data, and, and maybe you're saying, okay, I'm an enterprise B2B company where we have only 100 companies in the world that can buy our product. That's fine. Let's create data that is highly relevant to them and let's laser target it at them. One little trick, I didn't have time to cover it in this presentation, but how, how many people, people have like a B2B startup where you're, you're dealing with like very large customers? Okay, a few people. So here's a tip for this. I call it inbound pull PR. What you do is as you create this data, you actually use data that involve the companies that you want as clients. Okay? So you're actually using data and maybe you're doing a comparison of what, you know, I don't know, Cisco could do in this thing based on some data that you have, right? Versus some other big player you're trying to get. And what you're doing with this inbound pull PR technique is you're using the company's media and social media monitoring, either agency or tools, to draw them to you. So you create data, you have the company included in the data, and what happens is all of those big companies are tracking everything that's said about them. And what that does is that makes you show up on their radar, and you can embed within that data, within that article, things and insights and making it easy for them to contact you. So it's a way, as a small company, and if you do this consistently with your targets, you can pull a lot of those larger companies towards you simply in the data that you create and name dropping their names as part of that data. So Del Monte, two weeks, about 180 media hits, 75 plus local TV, 240 million impressions, about the equivalent of a $1.5 million ad buy, right? So for those of you who are small, and you need that kind of, you know, you, I'm assuming you can't spend 1.5 million if you've raised $2 million, right? So if you want that, this is a great way to, to get that traction. So build a simple data program that makes you valuable to the media that covers you. And again, if you don't have a great way to get that from your product, something as simple as a survey. Maybe it's a survey of your customers you already have. Maybe it's a survey of some of that, you know, sort of beta testing that you're doing with people who could be customers. Maybe that influences your data program, but it usually um, will pay off great dividends. Way number four, or, or, or I should say to do number four, share brand stories that activate key emotions. So at the core of sharing, word of mouth, virality, no matter what your company is, is the ability to activate emotions. Because emotions are the thing that cause us to take action. Right? And not all emotions are the same. Maybe you're super sad. If you're super sad, you kind of want to go home, pull up the covers, and like curl under the bed. Right? That doesn't cause you to share things. But are there other emotions that cause people to share your product, your brand, your solution, your service? And I mean this in a consumer sense, I'm going to give you a consumer example, but also in a B2B sense. Because if you have, you know, if you can activate emotions like, wow, if they get your product or service, this person's going to like see growth like they've never seen. They're going to impress their boss who's going to give them a fat bonus. They're going to then get a promotion and maybe take their boss's job. And then they're going to become CEO of the company. All of you, they just get your product. It's a powerful emotion, right? That causes them to want to take action and share it. So how can we activate those key emotions? So target emotions that naturally spark more social sharing, word, more word of mouth, that spread of your company and brand. And here's a specific example. So does anyone know, a few people have, been, have seen me talk before, I sometimes use this example. What is the most shared section of the New York Times? Anyone who's? Sports, sports. sports wh weddings. Okay, you have weddings on the mind, the mind. okay. Uh, anyone else? Comics, Comics crosswords, no? What's that? Dating? dating? Uh, is there a dating section in the New York Times? I mean, maybe. I got it. Got, okay. Uh, what else? Anyone? No? Not, none of those? Obituary. Obituary. You have a very dark side. You have a very, you're a dark, dark man. Um, anyone else? Opinion. Opinion? Okay. You're very opinionated, I can tell. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Fashion. 
Who's that? You look, yeah, you look fashionable in the back. Definitely. Okay. No, no. The most shared section of the New York Times is, and are your recipes? No. Okay. But it's the science section. It's the science section. Okay. And so, science section is shared, and that surprised a lot of people because, like, oh, I didn't know. I mean, a lot of people didn't like science. I mean, maybe people here like science, but a lot of people don't like science in school. Why would that be the most shared section? And it's because it activates the awe emotion. And what awe is, is that sense of how the world works, that sense of wonderment. It's how we're all connected, how this all fits together. Finally, I get it. But that can be wonderment about the world, but that can be also wonderment about ad tech lead generation if you're a, a software that helps, that works in that space. And finally, I get how this all works. I finally know how I'm going to scale my business and get more leads, right? That can be awe in something entirely unrelated like, perhaps, cats. So this is Morris the cat, and he is the Nine Lives spokes cat. Um, and basically, his job is to be finicky about food, but like Nine Lives. Because he's the every cat who has finicky taste, but likes Nine Lives. And so the question is, we, we like, and, and we're the PR agency for 18 different pet brands, kind of one of our little subspecialties. Um, and how can we leverage this notion of activating emotions to make content about Morris the cat and nine lives spread and grow really, really fast? Okay, so here's how we did it. And this is just a couple samples of cute cat, cat content. Who here likes cats or has a cat? Okay. Okay, well, okay. Enthusi enthusiasm. Great. Okay. So Morris cat wisdom. You can see the cat napping here. Number two, nap to win. You deserve a good nap. Personally, I sleep 16, 17, 18, maybe 19 hours a day, but not 20 hours. That would be excessive. Okay, so what we're doing there is it's cute cat content. It's a cat. He's, he's napping. Oh, adorable. But actually, what we're actually saying is, hey, humans, this is a lesson to you. We're activating awe here. You deserve a good nap. Come on. You deserve it. Give yourself a nap. And what we're trying to ask is, ah, you know what? I do need a good nap. Like, why can't I take a nap, right? Yeah, maybe I'll do that this Saturday. Why don't I just like, relax? I don't have to get all my errands, and I'll take a nap. So we're activating that as an emotion so that people can share that and say, you know what? I can really get behind naps. I'm like supportive of naps. I'm going to share that. OK, here's a second example. Morris Cat Wisdom number six, don't blame yourself. It says, you can see the potted plant fell over, and it says, stuff happens. Things fall over. Were you the one who discovered gravity? Unless your name is Sir Isaac Newton, the answer is no. So what he's saying here, we have a cute cat and knock something over. He's saying, you know what? You made a mistake. That's okay. Give yourself a break. Stuff happens. That's all right. You know, you made a mistake. So what? And so now we're acting and saying, you know, that emotion, that awe emotion again. Oh, you know, it's right. Like I ought to just like not take things so personally. I, okay, I made a mistake. That's okay, right? So we're activating awe there. So here's what happens. Um, basic posts on the uh, left-hand side was um, the um, prior social media agency, one of the most famous. And then this is us when we started activating awe. It went up, and this is about, like I think, two months' time, one to two months' time. It went from 7,500 shares to 83,000 shares simply by focusing on activating awe. This is audience reach, organic, unpaid on Facebook. We went from basic posts, about 2,600, activated awe, 25,000. Number of Facebook likes went from 174 on average post to 1,800 after we did this. Number of Facebook comments went up seven times. And we then started activating it in mass media. And we were trying to do these kind of stories in mass media and also trade on nostalgia people had for Morris. So this is BuzzFeed unpaid. Morris the cat was the original grumpy cat running an article. This is Los Angeles Times. Morris the cat is back. Make room grumpy cat. Uh, we're doing a little bit of a slingshot effect there around Grumpy Cat. Um, and New York Times, before there was Grumpy Cat, there was Morris, Nine Lives Reminds Consumers. Adweek actually did, I mean, this is the only interview I know of, of an interview with a fictional cat. They ran a verbatim uh, interview. Morris the Cat talks brand endorsements, naps, and how he really feels about Grumpy Cat, an exclusive interview. Um, and this is the overall monthly social performance. This is from... May 2016, um, prior agency to June 2000, or, I'm sorry, June 2014 to March 2016. So 
Number of likes in a month went from 15,000 to 300,000, up 20 times. Um, and this is all organic, unpaid. Comments went from 1,000 in a month to 15,000. Shares went up 25 times to 50,000 in a month. Audience reach went up 30 times to uh, 6 million. Uh, and so impressions, that's the big one that they measure, 20 times to 10 million organic impressions um, uh, in a single month, right? So it makes a huge difference when you can activate these emotions. And what you're trying to do when you do this, no matter what, whether you deal with cats, whether you deal with green beans, whether you deal with enterprise software, is activate those things that give people an understanding of the world and that causes them to want to talk about it, to want to take action, and, um, and to ultimately to share it. Okay, and five, target influencers that can amplify. So at PR Hacker, our influencer outreach program has really grown over the past couple years. We really started out with kind of a focus on bloggers, kind of grew into more like social media stars, grew into subject experts who are subject experts on your topic, and then now even deal with celebrities. And want to give you some examples of how you can use influencers in a efficient and effective way that doesn't have to take a lot of your time to really um, speed up your growth. So a small number of key influencers can spread your content globally. Here's an example. How many people is, re, uh, recognize this screenshot? This is Tara the Hero Cat. Does anyone? This is a cat who saved a four-year-old uh, boy from a dog who attacked the boy. Okay, and so Tara um, it's an interesting case. We wanted to study this, and so we went back and we actually recreated. It's kind of like, you know, if you like, if you study a disease and you want to figure out like where's like patient zero, and, like who started it. Um, if you ever saw the movie like World War Z with like Brad Pitt, like he goes back to find like who started like the zombie apocalypse, right? So we wanted to figure out how did this go from essentially um, zero to one million views in eight hours, and then from uh, to 20 million views in five days. Okay, so here's the breakdown. 4:30 a.m. It was first posted on YouTube. 5:03 a.m. Video airs in Bakersfield, California. 5:50 a.m. Cat's owner posts YouTube video to Facebook page. And this is destined to be a little video that no one sees, right? But here's what happens. It's a 10-minute span from 8:18 to 8:28, and it's only four people that spread this thing. It's two users on Twitter two users on Reddit, and they don't have huge audiences. What they happen to have is the right audiences. So these happen to be um, people that are in the media industry, like producers, editors, and they're not actually posting it to their own um, like publication or TV station. They're actually just sharing it on their personal. But they are personally followed by other people in the industry. And this is one of the key things that sometimes we have clients and they're like, okay, you know, I want to be on today's show, but I don't want to do that small little radio station because I don't think it's worth my time. And what we kind of say is we point to this and talk about it's all interconnected, right? That small little radio station, because the media talks to each other, may be followed by the producer for the Today Show. And that's how we create that snowball effect. So four users um, spread this. And, and um, so, and actually, and just to say, just to give you some perspective on this, this spread five times faster than Gangnam Style, right? So it went to 20 uh, million users in five days, not 25 days. And so what I would submit to you is that the velocity of influencer sharing is increasing. The velocity of virality is increasing. And in fact, you can accomplish this with the right influencers even faster than before. So how can influencers help us make the Milk Bone brand trend on social media? We created hashtag doggy date night on Twitter on February 3rd, and we had seven paid, and we're talking paid small amounts, $100 to $200. And 20 unpaid influencers invited fans to join our Twitter events and have a pre-Valentine date with their dog. This is really important for all of you that have sales windows and sales cycles, because what's going on here is Milkbone wants to sell a bunch of treats for Valentine's Day. The problem is, if we go out with an event that's on Valentine's Day, there are no, there's no time for people to buy treats. So we came up with the concept of doggy date night, a separate holiday that we could create and own, because now we can extend the window to start at February 3rd, raise people's awareness there, and now they have from February 3rd to February 14th to buy treats for their dog. 
right? So anyone that if you're using influencers strategically, you have sales windows at times, you use that to increase the size of your sales window. So here's a couple sample posts. You can see some, some dogs on hashtag doggy date night enjoying their milk bones. We're getting a lot of product placement there. You can see that Nala the Shibu Inu wants in. Hashtag doggy date night, you can see there. And these are all just regular people and they're doing complete product placement to the point where we can make this hashtag trend on Twitter and in two hours we generated 77 million impressions by doing that, right? So we're trying to find ways that we can leverage influencers to create this kind of spark. Let me give you some other examples and show you why you don't necessarily have to pay for this even when you involve big celebrities. So, um, Milk Bone, by the way, two hours, 6.1 million people overall, about 800 participants, about 8,500 uh, Twitter posts we generated in two hours. Okay? So, um, this is Julianne Huff. Anyone a Dancing with the Stars fan? And this is part, you can see, one of our clients is Harmless Harvest Coconut Water. Okay? Which is, if you haven't had it, it's like seriously the best coconut water. And you can see Harmless Harvest right here. So, she actually um, gave this gift basket to Nina Dobrev, who is an actress on The Vampire Diaries, because she wasn't feeling well, okay? And influencer, product, influencer is then promoting a product, and it might not seem like a lot, but people are now, okay, looking at InStyle Magazine actually did a feature on what was in her gift, gift basket, right? And we're seeing our product there. This is, I don't know if you can see it, this is Caitlin and Kylie Jenner. And I don't know if you can see it there, but Kylie Jenner is holding a Harmless Harvest Coconut Water bottle. And people wonder, and they ask, well, is she being paid to do this? And actually, no. Uh, only thing she's getting is free product, and she really likes it. And so, she has it there. Lots of fans are studying what's in this, but here's um, what happens later. Um, this is on her website. She's, she writes, I have a serious obsession right now with Harmless Harvest 100% raw coconut water. It has just a little bit of sweetness, but not too much. It is the most refreshing water ever, and my fridge is always stocked with it. Kylie Jenner. This is unpaid. Right? This is a placement of a product that then is going out to millions of people because we're leveraging that. Um, and so that's a, a really new program for us is really leveraging and, and a, having a scalable influencer program. And then finally, this is HBO Silicon Valley. Who watches Silicon Valley? So um, we've been sending a lot of coconut water to the show just for like to have in the green room for the show. And it's, it's a rare win when you actually get the product mentioned in the show and becomes part of the script. So this is Ehrlich Bachman, I don't know if you, if you know Ehrlich Bachman, he, I think, I forget in the show, he's trying to like impress someone who came over. He's asking, you know, would you care for another coconut water? And he's handing them a harmless harvest coconut water there, right? So, influencer can work in a lot of ways. It can be bloggers that are leveraged to create doggy date night. It can be really famous celebrities that even if you think they have to be paid, um, if you are strategic, what we do is we reach out to a lot of either agents, managers, stylists, kind of the people around them and get them product and we know if we have a good product um, they'll like it and we try to keep that you know in, in this case a coconut water is something that you can carry around um, with you you can be photographed with it so we, we want that to happen and so there's lots of opportunities to leverage influencers and if you don't have and whatever your field is you need to have an influencer program that might not be Kylie Jenner if you're doing enterprise software right but that could be other key people that have a disproportionate influence that can speed up. And if you're not, if you don't have a program where you're either getting hands of your product in their hands, getting them advanced versions of things, getting them exclusive access to things, just reaching out and um, what we always do is we come in and we comment and like and engage everything they're doing. We show some interest first. So all of those things, if you're not doing that, you really should. Um, my information is here. So Ben at PeerHacker.com, um, you can email me or uh, anyone at the team here. Um, and actually at our company, it's like first name dot last name at prhacker.com. Mine's a little bit unusual. So otherwise it will go to everyone. Um, and also the other fun thing that we do is we do these 30 minute brain hurricanes, which if this was useful to you, basically um, it's a 30 minute session. Technically it's 29 minutes because we have a 29 minute process um, where um, we'll do a live brainstorm uh, with you. Um, usually it's, it's live like you know, over the phone or something like that. And we'll actually go through this in more depth. So if you didn't get a chance to ask a question, you want our insights, we're happy to do it. It doesn't cost anything. And we'll just uh, kind of brainstorm what that, uh, campaign or that program could be to go from seed to series A. So that being said, I'll end on kind of the final thought of the day. And that is talking about 
how you take all these ideas we've, we've, we've had and how you leverage the mathematics of creativity and leverage the mathematics of traction and scalability to grow faster. And, and there actually is a mathematical process behind what, what we're doing. So this is the math of great story ideas. Um, and specifically, let's take someone's you know, app here and let's, let's take, you know, for example, how about the, the app about um, you get the, sort of the, the payday advance of your money through the app. Now, that's an interesting idea. And if we're like, okay, we want to position this. This is a new tech solution. It takes all the issues and problems with payday loans and makes it better and easier and faster like apps tend to do and disrupt things. And let's go out to Bay Area Tech with that story. So there's 700 media contacts in the Bay Area that cover technology at a 1% conversion rate. That's like low conversion, meaning we pitch 700, 1% is like direct mail, right? Low. We can expect seven media hits, right, if we go out with that story. Now, let's actually talk about is there a way that we can position her app for health? Because maybe it's like, oh, what are the health consequences when people are stressed out about money? What do people observe around tax day when they're worried about money and it actually results in physical ailments? Let's create something like that and actually talking about how just a little bit of anxiety reduction about filling in the gap when you're short in the month actually has a health consequence. Maybe it could. So there's 5,000 media contacts that cover health. At a 1% conversion rate, again low, we can expect 50 media hits if we do that story. Okay. Let's do money. Let's do money in a broad sense, right? Let's do that survey and let's talk about maybe some of those ideas about how much money for each you know, state or city across the US is earned but not yet paid. Let's go out to personal finance and talk about how to have, you know, be more mindful of your finances. Even when you're a little bit short, that's okay. Don't beat yourself up. Here's what to do when you are short in a month. 7,000 media contacts at a 1% conversion rate, that's 70 media hits. And finally, relationships, right? Let's talk about how money and that end of the month bills gets in the way of husbands and wives, boyfriends and girlfriends, and how that, how money, and actually we did for another client a survey, that money is the number one by far cause of stress, anxiety, and problems in relationships. By far, it's not even close. So how can you, if you do have a tough month or you, you did lose your job or something else, how can you work with your spouse to not let that affect your relationship. And maybe the app all of a sudden, again this is positioning the emotion of it, all of a sudden this isn't just an app about getting a little bit of advance of like a couple hundred dollars before you otherwise would. This is an app about having a happy marriage, you know, being with your lifelong soulmate. This is a map about connecting with the person you want to share your life with. That's incredibly emotionally activating and empowering. And we've shifted that, we've shifted the whole perception of the app with that story, right? So, 1% conversion rate, that's 90 media hits. So if we add all this up, the seven media hits from tech in Bay Area, health 50 media hits, money 70 media hits, relationships 90 media hits, that's 217 total. Just by thinking this creative process of how we can position our product in different contexts. And what I would submit is as you grow and as you go from seed to series A or series A to series B or wherever you are along your path, if you start actually testing and utilizing multiple verticals like this, you're actually testing your product market fit in lots of different ways. And you're doing it in a low cost way. You didn't have to build a product just for relationships. You simply change the messaging, change the story, and use the conduit of earned media to spread that out. And over time, not only one, can you accelerate your growth because a lot more people are going to know about your product, but you may decide that, okay, our app is going to be the relationship money advance app because that one vertical becomes so powerful that it actually shifts the whole direction of your company. So the last thing I'll leave you with is as you think about you know, the magic words which are product market fit, how do you find that product market fit, how do you scale it, how do you grow it, what I would submit is that instead of going with the approach that okay this is our hypothesis, this is the market we want, this is we're just going to focus on this, that we take a little bit of a broader approach. We think about how do we position our product in new and interesting ways for new and interesting topics. And if we do so, we may discover aspects of our market that we did not know about. We may grow faster than we thought we could and ultimately we may achieve success um, much, much faster in a much more efficient and effective way. So 
With that being said, were there at least two things that were mildly interesting or useful today? Say, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, let us know about a brain hurricane. Check out um, our YouTube channel, which is just youtube.com. I believe it's just slash PR hacking. We have a lot of tutorials there. Um, that's my information. And um, thank you so much for coming. We'll hang out and answer questions. And we wish you all that kind of success. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>